Good evening, and everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Robert Toombs, president of the RCA, an organization of over 650 artists, designers, and craftspersons. Joanne? Uh, alors, uh, mon nom est Joanne Charette. Je suis la secrétaire de l'Académie. Uh, nous sommes une organisation de plus de 650 artistes, designers et artisans. Ce soir, nous présentons notre onzième conférence Passage depuis 19, euh, 2018 avec notre invité, la sculpteur et artiste de l'installation Marianne Barkhouse, bien sûr, RCA. But tonight, we'll hear our 11th Passage speaker, artist speaker since 2018, sculptor and installation artist. Marianne Barkhouse. Alors que nous sommes réunis pour cette rencontre virtuelle présentée depuis Ottawa, nous reconnaissons que nous vivons, travaillons et apprenons en tant qu'invités. Pardon? Uh, en tant qu'invités. Just continue. Alors que nous sommes réunis pour cette rencontre virtuelle présentée depuis Ottawa, nous reconnaissons que nous vivons, travaillons et apprenons en tant qu'invités sur le territoire non cédé des peuples algonquins Anishinaabe. Nous disons « chi miigwech », alors merci, tout en reconnaissant le dur travail qu'il nous reste à accomplir afin d'éliminer les comportements d'injustice sociale qui ont été infligés par la société Colonisatrice. Well, as we gather for this virtual presentation from Ottawa, we recognize that we live, work, and learn as guests on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples and say, Chimegwitch, thank you for all this means, while recognizing the hard work that remains to be done in order to eliminate the social injustices that have been imposed by the colonizing society. Marianne Barkhouse est née à Vancouver, en Colombie-Britannique, mais elle entretient des liens solides avec les côtes Est et Ouest, puisque sa mère est de la bande Nilkish, Première Nation, euh, quoiqu'elle, d'Alerte Bay, en Colombie-Britannique, et que son père, d'origine germano-britannique, est de la Nouvelle-Écosse. Elle est descendante d'une longue lignée d'artistes de la côte nord-ouest mondialement reconnue, dont Ellen Neal, Mongo Martin et Charlie James. Elle détient un baccalauréat spécialisé de l'Ontario College of Art à Toronto et son travail a fait l'objet de nombreuses expositions au Canada et aussi aux États-Unis. So tonight's guest, Marianne Barkhouse, was born in Vancouver, British Columbia but has strong ties to both coasts as her mother is from the Nimkish band, Kwagul First Nation of Alert Bay, British Columbia, and her father is of German and British descent from Nova Scotia. She's a descendant of a long line of internationally rec recognized Northwest Coast artists that include Ellen Neal, Mungo Martin, and Charlie James. She graduated with honors from Ontario College of Art, Toronto, and is exhibited widely across Canada and the United States. Marianne? Over to you. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for advancing to the next slide. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, uh, for, for my talk this evening, what I was going to do was primarily talk about some uh, work that I currently have on exhibition uh, this year, as well as some, some works that are coming up in the new year. And, uh, but for people who may not be familiar with some of my work so far, or may have seen it and not realized that that was my work, I thought I'll cover um, just a few, uh, just a few uh, of my previous works. And now what I'm going to do, if you'll bear with me for just one second, while I, I'm just going to turn off my own video because that will probably make things run a little easier. Okay. Um, for my own best viewing <laughs> pleasure. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So the sound of yellow, the velocity of green. Yes, that's that sort of uh, sums up my my past year, I guess, with the uh, with this work with where the work is going. Um, as uh, I spent a, a bit of time out west, and it was a long hot summer out there, as people know. With the drought so the sound of yellow for me is actually the sound of 
millions of grasshoppers uh, zinging through parched grass. Uh, and uh, we'll get to the velocity of green. So um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is uh, one of um, my uh, earlier works that, uh, that I did, just to give people an idea of some of the materials that I work with. So this is a piece uh, titled Persevere. It's, current, it's in the collection of the go uh, Government of Ontario. And um, it's a little bronze beaver and he's, the velvet pillow that he's sitting on is uh, uh, he's actually covering up the map and it's one of the oldest maps from the fur trade that still exists today. Uh, it's a map of Ontario and it, it, it uh, depicted a lot of the, uh, the British um, fur trading depots, the French, and then some of the, the posts were identified as sometimes English, sometimes French because depending upon what was happening. So this was, I think from the late 1600s, maybe early 1700s, uh, the little map that he's covering. So some of the, uh, some of the work that I deal with uh, combines natural history um, with our own cultural history and uh, looks at things back uh, from that perspective. So if you could go to the, the next slide, please, Robert. So where, where do I get my inspiration? Where do things play into? This is one of the, a lot of my inspiration comes from my backyard, literally, as well as other places in, across Canada that I have either visited or lived in. Um, with my mom's family coming from British Columbia, uh, from a tiny island off the north end of Vancouver Island, and with my father um, coming from a farm in Hance County, Nova Scotia, um, that's obviously a considerable amount of territory that I've uh, lived and worked in over the years. Um, and so now I live up in the Halliburton Highlands and uh, my, my nearest neighbors are these beavers. So this is one of the beavers that was um, just outside my window uh, a few years ago. Next slide, please. And uh, so my, I live on a small acreage here. It's uh, like a lot of Canada, a lot of trees and rocks and rocks and trees. And in amongst some of these trees and rocks are things like uh, deer. I've had moose coming through the backyard as well. Next slide, please. I know the deer's going, how come you don't want to talk about me so much? Uh, but it's because I have to speak about the turtle. Uh, but anyway, when I first moved in here years ago, there was only a tiny little creek that ran through the back. Um, but several years later, uh, the water rose exponentially, almost overnight. And it was because beavers had moved back into the area and uh, had refurbished an old dam. And so now I've got a considerable amount of water. Uh, I guess almost lakefront property, but don't tell the uh, municipality because then they'll want to raise my taxes. Um, but enough of that. So anyway, there's creatures such as turtles and so forth. And so it's, I've just seen the whole property, I guess, and this area come alive. I've seen the cycles of um, areas when beavers leave the area, but also when beavers return. Um, and, the, and I've had a great appreciation of the, uh, the lush environment that species like beavers create. Next, please. So uh, when people uh, go to look at some of my artwork, like this piece, Sovereign, which is bronze, uh, bronze fox sitting on a fancy little chaise that was custom made for, for the fox. Um, you can see where some of the uh, elements of the area where I live right now are manifested in the material choices and the look of the pieces that I do. Um, and, and with these type of arrangements, what I'm trying to do also is not so much to anthropomorphize uh, the animals, but to give a level of consideration to their living spaces as far as we think, and trying to make that connection from like our living space and things that we value and think are important uh, and convey um, things that are of authority. And then looking at their living space and their and the wild uh, the different types of ecosystems and wildlands, and uh, what it means for us to be intruding in that, and also to show, I guess, to convey the idea that these animals are are so perfectly suited and form fit 
um, to their little ecological niche. Next, please. Uh, and so there's other, um, other works which look at not only the animals and how, uh, and how they fit their habitat, but also our interactions and the consequences of our actions um, with these different species. So this piece was Treats for Coyote. It was created originally uh, probably a, a, about uh, eight or nine years ago for uh, an exhibition that I had at the time called Regency, which was at Rodman Hall Art Center in St. Catharines. And again, I was situating the animal in a, a human domestic situation, but also the treats that are on the, the, little, um, the little serving dish there. Next, please. Uh, all the treats there, instead of the cakes and petit fours and little sundry items like that, that one might find at a tea or a very fancy tea. I, I don't have these at my house, but maybe someone does. Um, are animals that uh, coyotes feed, uh, feed on. So some of them are, wild, are, are their natural food, like voles and frogs and things like that. Um, and then other things are animals that we put in their way and that we provide for them uh, unwittingly. But uh, again, it's those ideas of consequences. So the, you know, an example of some of the animals um, are, are depicted in, in the little porcelain pieces on the dish there, which like uh, sheep and, uh, and, uh, and, and hens and, and rabbits and well, rabbits, I guess they're kind of a gray area because they're part of the wild diet as well. Uh, cats, unfortunately coyotes lo love cats. So, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> so um, these are the types of things that I was trying to show that it's uh, with these animals that I have deep respect for them, but I also have a respect for what they're capable of and what our responsibilities are when it comes to keeping our own animals, our own domestic animals safe. Uh, next, please. So, you know, again, back just briefly back to my own backyard, um, the, the consequences of just even the, the smallest thing, such as having uh, bird feeders, which in national parks, you're not allowed there, you're not allowed to feed uh, have bird feeders and for good reason because everything likes sunflower seeds. Bears like sunflower seeds, elk like sunflower seeds, foxes, as you know, in addition to the birds, of course. But when you put out a bird feeder, you have to assume that you're basically feeding almost everyone out there. Um, so once I put the bird feeder up, the deer started showing up and the deer will, uh, they'll stand right up and like jam their head right inside the bird feeder trying to lick out all the seed. So, and deer are very, I found they're very territorial. They, they fight amongst themselves so that they can get this bird seed. So here you see one of the uh, smaller deer uh, duking it out with another one um, over uh, bird seed rights. Okay, next please. So that was some of the, the work that I've done that deals with like, um, I guess, natural habitat or, or natural, natural history. This deals with natural history as well, but this was a piece that I did back in 2009 for a show at Wave Hill um, and it's called Harvest. So it was done in the, uh, I guess it was, there was a lot of uh, celebra celebrations around uh, the 400th anniversary of Henry Hudson discovering the New York area, New York City area uh, on behalf of the Dutch. Um, so there's a lot of celebration around that. And then Wave Hill um, had uh, approached several indigenous artists and said, could you do, or would you have any work that would be an indigenous response to the celebration because Every, there's, there's things to be celebrated. There's probably things, uh, there's another side to the coin. Let's just say that, other side to the coin. Um, so I was looking at my own, own background and things that have happened within my lifetime, things that have happened within uh, like commonalities that might've happened between the coasts, so the, the different coasts, even though I'm originally from the West Coast. Um, I've seen what's happened to the fish stocks and to the, 
uh, clam stalks and things like that um, from over harvesting. And that was some, a situation that came up uh, on the East Coast a heck of a lot sooner. Um, so just for an example, within, uh, within eight or nine years of Henry Hudson discovering that part of uh, the coastline and then the subsequent influx of of people or of, of settle, settlement and then the fur trade starting within it only took eight or nine years for them to completely extirpate like wipe out all the fur bearing animals like beavers sea mink things like that and that and thus started the fur trade um, or the beginnings of it so this piece was looking at that and how in 400 years beavers have made a comeback uh, in that time. There was a time when they thought that beavers would go extinct as, or, or be close to extinction in the same way that bison were and other animals. Uh, but they've been proof, proven to be very resilient. So 2009 happened to be the first time that beaver activity was spotted in the New York Manhattan area again. So thus the inclusion of the beaver. And uh, and then the, I've used the coyote a lot. This is the coyote, of course, ripping apart the fabric of, of that particular setting uh, because coyotes are also such, um, uh, such resilient species. Uh, and there's actually more coyotes now than there were 500 years ago. That has a lot to do with the fact that a lot of the wolves and the other larger predators like bear and cougar have disappeared, disappeared out west. Um, anyway, that's another discussion. I wasn't going to get into it, but of course I see coyotes. I start talking about. Next slide, please. So just to uh, um, I'll I'll elaborate a bit more about this uh, this piece. Uh, these are all works in porcelain, and with the return of the beaver to not only New York but other areas of the continent, um, I I made the place setting um, hopefully resplendent. Uh, with these uh, things that beavers like to eat. So the, these are meant to, these plates are all meant to look like uh, water lily leaves. And of course, beavers love to eat the roots of water lilies. Um, they especially like to eat the roots of fancy water lilies that you plant in your pond, but they eat all water lilies. Uh, and inscribed on these plates were the uh, names of the different Lenape, uh, Lenape Confederacy who of course were also the first to uh, experience the influx of uh, colonial um, settlement. Next, please. Uh, this is an example of one of some of my uh, outdoor pieces. It's called Namatsala, which in Kwakwala means to travel in a boat together. It's a, at the Canadian Museum of History. And it was based upon a story that my grandfather had told me. Uh, many years ago, but even though it's based upon his story or inspired by his story, um, it is also informed by the sensibilities from both sides of my family. Uh, next slide, please. So with this location, it was such a gift. I have Leanne Martin to thank uh, for that as she was the one who I worked with. Uh, she commissioned me in the, creating this piece for the museum. And uh, at, at the heart of my grandfather's story, what I took away from that was that um, because he did uh, apparently help uh, a wolf get across, uh, this was out in British Columbia, out in the you know, northern Vancouver Island area, and wildlife swim back and forth between the mainland, the Vancouver Island, and all the little islands that are in between on a regular basis. So this is not um, unusual. And uh, sometimes the wildlife actually will get into people's boats because, you know, maybe the swim just ended up being longer than what they thought it would be. Uh, so for my grandfather to let a wolf come into his skiff, and it would, it would have been a skiff, it wouldn't have been a, a big fancy uh, traditional quagil um, boat. Um, I thought that takes, you know, a compassion for other things and having latitude of thought uh, and consideration for other things. So I thought if this location is of course a gift for many reasons. One, that if there was ever a piece about compassion and latitude of thought, I thought being across the river from Parliament Hill was very apropos. Next slide, please. So this brings me to my new work. Um, and 
It was, uh, so it's currently at Wanaskewin Gallery, which is in Saskatoon. And again, looking at these issues with um, around uh, issues of indigenous uh, restoration of culture with foods, food sovereignty and things like this, um, I was inspired by the, the return of bison to that area. So just last year, Wanaskewin had uh, bison that they reintroduced to the property uh, and it's a small herd right now it started with a, as 11 individuals I believe so that's some of the first cows uh, with their calves that were born last year um, and so I, I wanted to explore that uh, more in terms of the celebrating that and also looking for and reasons to celebrate that for looking forward and what it means for not just in um, indigenous people culture, but the indigenous the indigenous species of the tall grass prairie uh, that exists all over the, that that part of Canada and the northern United States. Next slide, please. So the exhibition is called. Uh, oh wait, they, I guess you wanted to see the bison again. They are very fetching looking. Um, the uh, the exhibition is called the Pimaha, and confusingly, that main installation that's in the center is also called a Pimaha. A Pimaha is the name of the creek that runs behind Wanaskewin. Uh, Wanaskewin is um, not only is it a gallery, but it's a heritage center. It's the site of I think one of the oldest buffalo jumps in uh, in Canada. It's been the site. It's an active archaeological uh, act active archaeological dig area um, and they've been unearthing just amazing things for decades there so um, with that gathering of people that have traditionally been coming there for thousands of years uh, harvesting the bison um, I again I, I guess I'm just drawn to these table settings because it, it, it it's such a wonderful format to work with in terms of speaking about species and speaking about the landscape and thinking about, I think, trying to also bring into consideration what kind of guests we would be, what kind of guests are we in, in the landscape. Um, sometimes we're pretty bad guests, <laughs> sometimes we're great. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, and then along with this, um, uh, with this table piece, I also had uh, worked with a tapestry uh, facility that was actually done in the stage cr to create these uh, tapestries. I've uh, again, I'm referencing. I, th I know a lot of European culture and, and tropes from European culture from hundreds of years ago, uh, possibly thousands in some cases. Um, and thinking, uh, I, and I do that partly because because of the interaction between cultures. And also looking at how trying to inhabit the ideas of the settlers that came from away and came here and their ideas of of um, of uh, things things that they would use to evoke. Uh, no, that's okay. You can go to the next one. Uh, uh, the evoke uh, authority and um, and celebration. So tapestries are one way of doing that. So. Uh, a, a series of uh, there's three tapestries on one side and a long one on the other. Each of them has a different focus. They feature um, woven, and these are all like woven tapestries. It's not just inkjet print. Not not that there's anything wrong with inkjet print on tapestry, but um, uh, there's uh, or inkjet print on fabric. They're woven tapestries to uh, with images of uh, species that interact with bison in some way are or that are dependent upon a bison engineered ecosystem to fully function so for for this one at in arcadia ego which also has relation uh, uh i guess resonance with uh nicholas poussin uh paintings from the 1700s nicholas poussin was one of louis the 14th's um favorite uh uh, favorite painters, and I realize I'm throwing a lot of different references out here, but just in case people are going, hmm, that sounds familiar. Yes, it was intentional. Uh, so anyway, these are species, sort of land species. Next, please. 
And uh, I'm just going to have a quick sip of water here. And the, uh, the, uh, the tapestry on the left, I'm sorry, I don't have any close ups of them, anything that was a closer detail of some of those other ones yet. Uh, but the tapestry on the left was around, uh, says Acta Sanctorum, the deeds of, which is the deeds of the saints. Uh, and it features um, one of the images from the, um, the Hunt of the Unicorn Tapestries that is in the collection of the Cloisters in New York currently. And so one of the, the myths uh, around unicorns is that uh, unicorns are able to purify water. So in this particular scene, I've set it up that the, the unicorn is kneeling down in the act of about to purify water, or is he? Uh, because then there's uh, a little pronghorn antelope that, that is also kneeling down. Maybe it's the, ant is the antelope teaching the unicorn how to do it. Um, in the background, maybe the bison are overseeing it. And I have the bison there purposely because bison interact with water very differently than cattle do. How their activity works around, uh, around water is to, um, they don't muddy. Again, I realize that's a huge other conversation, but they don't muddy um, water sources in the same way that cattle do. So that's why I thought, well, they'd be in there. Maybe they're overseeing the whole thing. And then as the water is coming out of the fountain, there's beavers there trying to dam it up because, well, that's what beavers do. Uh, the sound of running water is what triggers beavers to, uh, what triggers beaver to uh, start their damming activity. So all the, the uh, a lot of the details that are that uh, are featured around that uh, tapestry are, have to do with water, water systems, and the one on the right um, is a, it's a, sorry, my my eyesight is terrible. Les, les vieilles connaissances, which is the the old acquaintances. So that's uh, all. All of the images that are that are the center images are taken from land the the Wanaskewin's landscape, like right on the property at Wanaskewin. So one of the uh, the key uh, one of the features that's there is this gigantic uh, glacial erratic, which bison use to, of course, rub themselves on because bison are very itchy creatures. So I was just envisioning this meeting between this this giant rock, this boulder that hundreds of years ago would have seen thousands and thousands of, of bison moving around it, scratching themselves on it. And then the bison, of course, coming up to it. And I can just imagine that boulder going, oh no. And the bison going, oh yes. But that's just me. Okay, maybe we should move on. Next. And this is a, a, a long, uh, to give you an idea of some of the size of this, this is almost 14 feet long, this particular uh, tapestry, it's called Bison Gate. So for this particular one, I had a, a panorama of Wanaskewin's uh, uh, property and uh, with an assortment of bison and bison related lore, uh, from, from the area, but some of it's actually from France as well, from cave painting in France. Some of the history, so I was trying to look at the, the history of bison, not only in North America, but also over in France. I mean, some of the oldest uh, artworks in existence are the cave paintings. I was very, uh, I was very fortunate to see some uh, in person a, a few years ago. Cave paintings um, in Neo. Uh, in the south of France uh, with, uh, you know, there's a lot of bison that are depicted there. And what was really interesting, I heard, uh, I was told was that even though the bison were painted, like you go like a kilometer and more deep into the, the side of the mountain, and then there's these images of bison on the walls, but the bison actually apparently didn't live in that particular area. They lived somewhere else. So what would possess someone to go that far into the mountain? It's, it's just amazing, completely amazing. Um, and when I, I was listening to Dr. Ernie Walker, who is uh, the founder or one of the founders of Wanaskewin, and he was a key person um, getting the, the bison reintroduced back to the property. And when I was listening to, and he's an archeologist, so he's, he's also the one who I think made some of the first archeological, or if was the one who made the first archeological discovery on that property of the, uh, the Buffalo jump. So when he was talking about reintroducing the bison and he was, 
you know, talking about, you know, how it's like a window into time, looking at like through the archaeology, but also bringing the bison back. And I thought, hmm, windows into time, portals. I was thinking about these portals through time. Uh, so if you can go to the next, hopefully I've got, got this in the correct order, the next slide. Yes, there it is. So I thought a portal in time, oh, that's, that's kind of like the Stargate. So I used to, of course, watch, used to watch Stargate uh, years and years ago. So I positioned the Stargate there discreetly off in the corner. Um, there's Ernie and the, uh, the bison manager, Craig, there. I, I took a, an image of the bison as they were being released out of their trailer onto the property. Um, and uh, just put that all in the bison in the Stargate. So I thought made sense to me. I don't know if it makes sense to anyone else, but uh, just in case you're wondering, Bison Gate, where did that come from? Okay, next, please. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so to get again, just to kind of recap some of this to um, show you some of the relationship between the pieces. Uh, and with that, uh, the table that's in Okemaha, I wish uh, the, the legs are supposed to be like, uh, they're, it's all, you know, carved wood legs that are supposed to look, <clears throat> excuse me, I need some more water again, <clears throat> supposed to look like a bunch of bison running underneath the table, uh, because they are the ones that are, are running or um, <clears throat> the motivating factor behind the, this really incredible ecosystem. Uh, out in the tall grass prairie in, in uh, Saskatchewan. Um, so on the table, if you can go to the next one, you might, the next slide. Oh, this is uh, the, probably the making of the, a little bit of behind the scenes making of the table. On the, on the table are uh, an assortment of, uh, of ceramic dishes that de depict different uh, species uh, in that ecosystem but also burnt into the top of the table is the map of a Pimaha Creek. And uh, it's burnt in. And then, so I worked with the glass blowers at Artex Studios um, here in the Halliburton Highlands to uh, pour, have glass poured and depict the, that map of, the, uh, of a Pimaha Creek directly into the table. Cause I wanted to get that idea of things interacting with each other. So I thought, it doesn't get more basic or more one-on-one -on -one than something like fire and, and wood and glass being poured into uh, onto a maple. So I feel kind of bad for the maple, but you know, it, it's an amazing tree. It's to them. And of course, there's the glass blower's wonderful little dog, Nori, uh, sitting safely outside the studio. Okay, um, next one, please. So what uh, Jen and Terry Craig do are, is in completely amazing. Um, and it's almost, if, if anyone hasn't watched Glass Being Poured, uh, it's, all, it's like a very um, beautiful but dangerous ballet of the two people as, as the glass is being poured and then as they snip off the glass and then having to put the whole thing, uh, let the glass set up. And then we have to put out the fire. But uh, so this is just a few images of the glass being poured. Next, please. And here's a few close-ups of some of the, the the plates that are on the on the table, as well as you can see the uh, a bit more of the detail of the finished result of the glass insert into the table. Um, and the ceramic that I used was a variety of stoneware and porcelain, and as I, I mentioned, depicting various. Um, uh, species, uh, bird species, insects, all kinds of things, reptiles uh, on the ceramic. Next, please. And uh, that's another detail, Luna moss. There's of course there's Luna moss out there, crickets. And on the, the napkins that I've created for that piece, they're cyanotype on linen and the images on the napkins are all scavenger birds because they're they're the cleanup crew, so the vultures and uh, seagulls and things like that. We, they're a valued and important member of uh, the ecosystem as well. Next slide, please. Oh, that was a, is that the last? Okay, and, and the next one after that. And of course, at the end of the table, 
the coyote and the badger because no one ever invites them to sit at the table. But they show up anyway. So I've, uh, I've done this coyote and badger as a limited edition series um over the years and i've used them in conjunction with because i wanted to get at the idea of different ecosystems and the coyote especially um the badger isn't always part of the installations it's only brought in if it's a relevant um relevant to the particular area but in other ones i've used a coyote because the coyotes have been so adaptable and i wanted to show that whether it's uh the carolinian forest or um the boreal uh forest or Canadian Shield area or the tall grass prairie, there, there's coyotes. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another, uh, another piece that was in the exhibition. Um, again, playing on these ideas of domestic situations um, and setting, setting these species in domestic situations, but also looking at them, using them as a as a play toy, but also the, I guess the insinuation there would be um, how we use ecosystems essentially as a play thing um, when sometimes we're coming to it with a very rudimentary knowledge of how those ecosystems are actually working. So this was a piece called Transect and instead of a rocking horse, there's a rocking bison and uh, two saucy little magpie pull toys um, facing off against the uh, with the, the bison. Next, please. And this is a new series that uh, I'm, I've just started. It's uh, the first four of a series that will probably um, go on for uh, several years. It's called I Corvid, and it's looking at different elements of history and natural history, um, again, as well as uh, cultural history from the Raven's point of view, Raven's having been the observers for a heck of a lot longer than we have been. And of course, Ravens have their own idea about things, its own Raven take. So it's of course me imagining what the Raven would be thinking about um, from thousands of years ago, before the last ice age, before the ice receded, um, and, uh, and then subsequently after. Uh, so these are all, uh, a digital print. These ones are digital print on linen. And I've sourced a lot of the imagery. Actually, there might be a close up in the next slide. If you can go to that, please. Um, I'm not sure if you can make out some of the imagery, but I've taken this from some of the illuminated manuscripts and books of hours from hundreds of years ago, where they had really uh, detailed um, images of flora and fauna, but also I've, in some cases I've substituted, uh, substituted uh, North American um, imagery for the plants and animals that are there, but sort of doing a take on uh, using that format as well. Um, and, and again, some of these images, images are sourced from like these historical uh, like bestiaries and things like that. And they're mixed in with photographs and illustrations that I have done myself. Okay, uh, next please. So this is a, uh, some of the other uh, tapestry pieces. Now confusingly, I know, I, I call things tapestries and they're not really tapestries. Um, so those other items that you saw previously, those were tapestries. These two pieces are tapestry one and tapestry two. However, they're not really tapestries in the conventional sense of the woven one because, well, why not? Um, these two pieces have taken as their inspiration. Uh, the first one actually tapestry one is called Truth and Reconciliation. And that's the piece on the left. And the blue one on the right is tapestry two to build a better lodge. Um, and what uh, you can't see in the image is that there's a beaver at the other end, uh, a sculpture of a beaver at the other end. Uh, so these have been works in progress for several years. There was a first iteration uh, several years ago at Esker Foundation, which I'll show to you a bit later. Um, but when, when the truth and uh, when the TRC came out with their report several years ago, not that long ago, I was wondering how, if anyone would take notice. And um, my mother went, uh, went to residential school 
Uh, she was at St. Mike's, which is a not very notorious residential school that was in Alert Bay, BC. Um, so it was something that I grew up knowing. Uh, it's not something we talk about all the time, because why would you dwell on something like that? But it was something I, I grew up that we knew that was, a, that was part of um, our family story. But I also came to realize that no one else knew what I was talking about when I did artwork or when I talked about it. It, was, it wasn't something that was known or there was much public awareness until recently. Uh, so I wanted to create a piece that just kind of visually depict, depicted what I thought was the enormity of what was contained uh, in the TRC's report. So yeah, you can stay on this one for just a moment um, because in Tapestry One, that's the entire executive summary, all 500, I think it's 563 or 564 pages of the TRC's executive, the executive summary. And over top of that, I've put um, images, transparent images of birds that are common to some of the important clans of First Nations across the country. Uh, and so then we can go to the, the next one. Thank you. Please and thank you, the next slide. And so this piece, um, which is a work, I, it will be a work in prog, it is a work in progress. As I show it in different locations, I add imagery to it. So since this was, um, this piece doesn't have uh, the truth and reconciliation documents on it. It has historical treaties that I have uh, created on, um, through cyanotype on linen. Historical treaties uh, from across the country dating back almost over 400 years ago. Eventually it will have ones that are more, more contemporary ones, but I'm just starting with the historical ones. Uh, so of course this being in Saskatchewan, there's, there's uh, Treaty 4 and there's Treaty 6 in this one. And then over top of the treaties, I have embroidered uh, images from signs of protest in my lifetime uh, from Indigenous protests in my lifetime is uh, my, my mother's sister was very active within the, uh, I guess, the American Indian movement, um, Red Power. So again, that was the, the flip side. I was, I've grown up also knowing about the importance of the Indigenous voice and the response and how that has uh, played out over hundreds of years. Um, but I've, for the embroidery, I'm just using my lifetime, which is 60 years. Uh, and juxtaposing the contemporary signs of protest against these historical documents. Um, so as I show it in different areas, I'll be adding to it from the historical documents that are relevant to that particular area. Uh, next, please. And this is uh, just to show the, uh, the piece that was, uh, that first piece, its first iteration, Tapestry One, um, as it first appeared at Esker Foundation in Calgary, because uh, then this one shows, um, you get a better idea of the other side with the, the little beaver facing off, sort of contemplating. So of course there's, uh, again, this, this long scroll type work with beaver chews. Of course, I've no, there's no shortage of beaver chews at my place. Um, and a little bronze beaver contemplating the document that is in front of him. Uh, next slide, please. So I begin with beavers. I should end with beavers. Uh, there's a, uh, again, one of my neighbors there on the left-hand side. And also, this is one of the other pieces. It's an older piece that I did uh, around 2011 on the right-hand side. It's called Dominion. And actually, uh, a portion of that will be up in Hamilton um, as a billboard coming up very shortly. It's part of the Super Crawl Festival. So if anyone's in the Hamilton area, they can, they'll look up and they'll see this giant image of the, uh, of the wolf, uh, which was actually, it's a picture I took of one of the wolves that was, uh, she's no longer there, but she's at one, the Halliburton Wolf uh, Center. And across it is the, the um, one of the first phrases from the book of Genesis, uh, which ostensibly gives uh, power over everything that swims in the sea and flies and walks on the earth to people. And how the juxtaposition of that with what I grew up, I guess the sensibility I grew up with from um, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous sides of my family about the responsibility that we have um, 
sure um, in some people think you have dominion, but I think really more about more to, I think what's more important to think about is that um, from an indigenous standpoint, it was never so much about this is all ours to do with as we as we please. This is all of our, this is ours to help take care of. Um, it's something that both, both my grandfathers on both sides, um, one was a farmer and one was a fisherman. Uh, just that, the idea of how you have to look after the land, if it's going to look after you, or in my uh, one grandfather's case, you know, how we have to look after the sea, the clams, all these issues around harvesting, over harvesting. Um, that lies at the, the, um, the heart of a lot of the work that I'm doing here the teachings from my family, but also what the, the land has been saying to me. Land because says all kinds of stuff. I know that sounds a little weird, but I think you know what I mean. Uh, next, uh, next, uh, the last slide, please. And so I give the final, the final um, images for the animals to talk, when I talk about the velocity of green, uh, the importance of green. Uh, the velocity of green is like hummingbirds. <laughs> <laughs> I've been very inspired by hummingbirds, and there's an amazing book um, that Nicholas Reddick uh, just published. Um, I think it, oh, I hope I get the title right, The Last Hummingbird West of Chile, um, and, and in which he was inspired. He had this uh, image in his head of these, these uh, old tall mast ships covered in hummingbirds, and I thought, what an incredible, like, just image to, to think of. Um, but it's that's the sort of thing. It's like the land is so inspiring. I mean, these bison are so inspiring that they can, they let that was that was like the picture when I took that picture. It was like probably over forty degrees that day. It was the heat was literally shimmering off the backs of the. You could see it in the image that I I I, I, I photographed. Um, in the middle is an evening primrose that was just beside my house. And when I was going out to my studio one day, I thought. Oh, that's a, I never noticed that the evening primrose had a pink part to the flower. And I looked closer and I thought, oh my goodness, that's a moth. I have never seen a, a pink moth. Although they've probably been there all along and I've never noticed them. And they have the, um, the very cunning name of evening primrose moth <laughs> once I looked it up. Uh, but it's part and parcel of these things that are just so incredible they're inspiring i hope you got i think you get the idea of where i get some of my ideas from this little hummingbird sits in the summertime sits out front of my kitchen window and scratches and i watch his life so it's like observing all of these things i try and imbue that into my artwork and i hope that viewers can take away from that what they will um this is my point of view but hopefully it gives uh room for your opinions, your thoughts, and for you to perhaps take away fresh considerations about our impact on land. Okay, peace out. Thank you very much. Oh, before I stop, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Robert, Susan, Nick, and Joanne for helping me uh, put this, host this all tonight. Thank you to the RCA, you're amazing. And I wanted to say thank you to also the Wadiskewin Gallery and Esker Foundation um, for helping with some of the images that were in my presentation. Okay, Marianne, thanks okay. very much. Um, I, I haven't got a prepared statement, but obviously very personal uh, recounting of your process and your history. And uh, I, I feel you know, honored to, to have been part of the process to to bring this to the to the public and uh i i sort of feel well what what we're what what it leads to at the end is just to see what is the next thing going to be and so i just want to thank you so much and uh, our next thing will be um blake gopnik will give a lecture on andy warhol and the origins of art on november 27th so still want to thank marianne but that we have another talk on art uh, coming up, uh, you know, in less than less than uh, what would that be less than three weeks or approximately three weeks. So thanks very much for everybody for participating. And thank you, Marianne. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for showing up. You were brilliant, my friend. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Just so impressed. <laughs> thank you. I knew you were great. But when we hear you speak, 
with such eloquence <laughs> and such fierce uh, conviction about your work. I'm, it's really been a treat. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Brigitte. I appreciate yes, that. Yes, Queen. <laughs>